brought these flowers up here for a reason. So this would be your nonfiction. This is your real, um, your real group of flowers. And then up there, you have your photo, which would be considered art, if you're a photographer. You have your painting. And then I wrote a little prose. Soothing light embraces the bulbous blooms, saddened that their cresting beauty diminishes in fading rays as one by one pink petals fall to their glassy graves. So I wrote that to kind of be a fiction piece that represents these flowers. And I wrote that because me and my twin are turning 42 tomorrow, so <laughs> I was feeling a little, feeling a little sad. <laughs> and so fiction writing is a representation of real life. If, if when you write and you're so far out there and people can't relate, they're not going to read your book. So if your protagonist or your main character is a worm, they're probably not going to, unless you put human characteristics in it, they're not going to relate. So you want your fiction to relate to reality. And so when I talk about writing fiction and what makes a good book, it's the same thing that can be applied to your life. Because you are living the story. And, and because you exist, you have meaning, and so you are a character in the story of your life. So everything I talk about, if you're not a writer, you can still apply this to who you are and to your goals. Okay, so I'm going to start off with a little story. This book is called Granola Bar Devotional, and this is the one where all proceeds go to African missions. And if you buy one today, you'll get a magnet that says, I support African missions. Um, my sister Shay and my twin sister Christina, our brother, and his family are missionaries in Mombasa, Kenya. And so it goes directly to them. And he always asks me to go visit, and I tell him I'm not called. But I can do something. I can write. So I can write and help them. So I have a little story that it's going to help you understand fiction. So. So I have this purpose to write this book. So everything starts with this purpose. It's internal. It's inside of you. So I have this purpose to write this book. And so once you get that purpose, you make the goal. And what was the goal? To publish it. So I have that purpose. And in between, I feel like I need to get down. And in between the purpose that's internal, you set your goal. And the goal is external. So you have to set that goal. But what happens is, in between the purpose you set, I mean the purpose you have and the goal you set, are obstacles. And, and obstacles create tension, and those are very important in a book. You want to create that tension. And so you have a character who has this calling, you need to do something, like Frodo, he needs to put the ring in Mount Doom. And then you have the end result, where he actually gets it into Mount Doom. But in between, and we're going to talk about that later, there's obstacles. Right? So I wanted to publish this book, but what happened in between was I got mouse shoulder. Does anybody know what mouse shoulder is? It's new, it's from clicking the mouse so much. <laughs> it really is. It's, I, I got radiating pain from my back down my arm to my fingers. And I literally couldn't just sit anymore. It hurt so bad. And when I put my arm out, it, it was excruciating. I couldn't do it anymore. Because I, I write a lot, of, a lot of books. I write three to five books a year. And so that repetitive, even though it's a small movement, that repetitive motion of clicking the mouse created mouse shoulder. So OK, so I'm here. I want, I have this calling. I need to write this book. I see the goal. I need to publish it. But in between is this obstacle of mouse shoulder and it's creating tension. So you have two choices you can do at that moment. You can say, it's impossible. I can't do it and you can walk away. Or you can do what Frodo said and said, I'll, I'll give it a try. And so what I did was I took the mouse from the right hand of my keyboard and I moved it to the left. And I told my left hand, you are gonna do this and you are gonna learn. You are gonna rise up because right hand can't do anything. <laughs> and so I felt like I was in kindergarten again. I, I, I thought I was going to erase everything. And this anthology is the first one I've ever done. 90 different stories. I had to copy and paste. 44 different writers. I had to copy, uh, get their bios and get their photos. I had to format it. I had to format it for ebook and for um, print book. 
and I designed the covers. And so you see those granola bars? It was all one image. I had to, I had to do this, the slow movement of like erasing around them so I can make them clear. And when I first started doing it, my right hand kept wanting to come over and I was like, nope, you're staying. And so it took hours for me to sit here and do it and make sure I didn't erase anything. And then I had to send the book out for copy editing and then I had to change the commas. But finally, after about a month, what happened is you get a story arc. The story arc of the book is where you have that purpose, you have that goal, and you achieve the goal. This, is, this was the end result of my story arc. But there's also something called the character arc, and that's where the character, and in your book, you want to do this, you want your character to transform. Physically, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, relationally, they get the girl, they need to transform. So when I started here, I was one person. On the other end, I am ambidextrous with the mouth. It was an actual physical change that occurred because I had that calling that I needed to do. And, I, and the obstacle was there. And in real life, I started writing 13 years ago and there were tons of obstacles. To, to, me, to be able to do that, I had to learn how to write a book. I had to have writers who trusted me with their words, who knew I could do a good job. I had to learn how to type, how to read, how to do uh, cover designs. There were a lot of different obstacles that I had achieved on other goals before. But for this one book, it was the obstacle of my mouth shoulder. And so now I do everything with my left hand, so there's a character change. Does that make sense so far? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so there's my little thing. That's my purpose, it's internal. I, I have a desire to do something. My goal is over here. It's, the goal is never right by your purpose. It's always far, far away. And if it's a very big purpose, it's even a goal that's even farther away. And then in between is my obstacle, my mouth shoulder. It created tension. And so, um, and so as I do my character arc, I change, I'm transformed. Okay, so now I'm just gonna go quickly over genres. There's nonfiction, there's fiction. And so here's a list of the genres. We have many people representing here who, who write different genres. So comedy, historical, literary, middle school, children's fiction, Christian fiction. Um, mystery, suspense, thriller. Mystery, the protagonist, the main character. Um, well, the event has already occurred and now the protagonist is trying to figure it out, right? And so usually in mystery, they know more, the, the protagonist knows more than the reader does. And at that end, the, the detective puts it all together and you're like, wow, that was great. But some of you guys figure it out before, you know, the ending, I'm sure. Uh, suspense, the protagonist does not know what's about to happen, but the reader does and it causes suspense. We see that person in the room and, it, and they don't see them and it causes that suspense. And then thriller, the person is just trying to avoid being killed, usually, <laughs> and it causes that, that tension. And then I just want to point out one more, um, speculative fiction. Has anybody heard that word being thrown around, speculative fiction? That's an umbrella for, um, and that's what I write, speculative fiction. I do fantasy and um, dystopian. But speculative fiction is the umbrella for dystopian, which is like Hunger Games, um, fantasy, horror, and science fiction. So when someone says they're a speculative fiction writer, they're one of those. Okay, so that's me. I'm dressed up as, can anybody guess? Daphne. Daphne Blake. <laughs> I, I go to this conference called Realm Makers, and it's all speculative fiction writers, and the award night you actually dress up in a genre. And so um, that's why I'm wearing that outfit. <laughs> I wouldn't wear it otherwise, but um, <laughs> that is Eddie Melson, and this is blend, people blend genres. That's what they're doing now, it's so cool. So this is steampunk. Anybody know what steampunk is? Wild West in America, in, in uh, England, it's Victorian age. Um, so she wrote a steampunk fable historical. So she took the story of Robin Hood and Maid Marian and put them in steampunk age, and then she also threw in some sci-fi in there because there was animals who were half uh, robots. And so she blended three genres. And this one's hilarious because 
you know, I would complain to my husband, nobody's reading my book, and he would say, just put a bonnet on your main character and it'll sell. <laughs> but he literally, this is Carrie Meads, he's so amazing, I'm doing another anthology, and he is one of my writers. He's actually jumping from speculative into nonfiction and whole new genre. But he wrote Amish Vampires in Space. <laughs> and he researched, he researched because he wanted to respect the Amish people, and his vampires are not the Romanian vampires, they're more like the sci-fi kind of vampires. And I'm, I'm actually reading another one of his books, I don't know if I can do that one just yet, I got that one for my husband. And then, so I got to meet a writer of um, Star Wars, they have a whole bunch of different writers, and she wrote two of the books. And her name is Kathy Tears, and she's a lovely, lovely person. She just got married when I met her, uh, like two weeks ago. And she, okay, so fantasy or sci-fi? People argue, is this is this fantasy? Because it has other worlds, it has aliens, has that fantasy feel, but it also has the sci-fi, where you have the um, new technology in the spaceship. So it's, it's kind of both. Star Wars is both. Okay, oops. Okay, so this is my next anthology, and I'm getting a lot of these uh, speculative fiction writers to write like real stories about their life, because people want to um, read it. And the one that Carrie Meets um, wrote, a woman read it, and she just, her husband just passed away, and she, she wrote him and said, I don't read any of your books, because I'm not a sci-fi person, but I, I really loved your nonfiction piece. So as a writer, uh, you really can skip genres. I mean, there are preferences, but you can you can really write in any. My twin sister tells me I could write about a toilet if I if I. She said I'm such a good writer I could write about a toilet, make it interesting, and I will someday. It's true. <laughs> and this, this is my Halloween costume. I'm genre. Can you guys guess what genres you see? I'm wearing the. Uh, well, I'm doing the live long and prosper. But I have the Star Trek pen, I have the Lord of the Rings um, necklace, I have cowboy boots, western, I have the sword of Star Wars, I have steampunk hat, and, and my dress is fantasy or it could be um, um, renaissance, so I, I was genre from Halloween. <laughs> and some people loved it and some people were like, you can't do that! <laughs> Star Trek and Star Wars together! <laughs> Okay, so plotting versus pantsing, and I'm just gonna go real quick. Plotters, so if you if you go on vacation and you're the person who gets the hotel, gets the, the ticket, plans every day, you know where you're gonna go, you've already researched, you got the tickets, you're a plotter. You're the person who does a lot of work in the front end. You do your character sketches, you do your world building, you do your chronological of events. You know, what's your main climax? What's the purpose? What's your goal? Remember, all books have to have that or it's, it's gonna be boring, they're gonna throw it away. And then um, you list everything out. You do all the work in the beginning. So pantsing is when you kind of know what you're gonna do, you kind of know your characters, you've been thinking about it, and you just let the story unfold. You, you wanna be surprised as well. And I'm in between. I have, um, I do, I think about my characters a lot in my mind and I get to know them. I'll work out and I'll be thinking about a scene in my mind and I'll have to stop what I'm doing and run to the computer and write that scene out. But I do, um, I do, I, I like to be surprised. I like to put my characters in surprising settings and see what they do. I don't know what they're gonna do, but I'm gonna find out. So I do a little bit of both. Um, And then word count, this is just, you know, standard books, fiction books are 80,000 words. And I'll have this all on my blog, it'll be a free download. All fiction books are around 80 to 120,000 words. Fantasy fictions tend to be um, longer, but you kind of want to hit that mark. Um, my Eve of Awakening, my first book, when I first wrote it, was 125,000 words. And I overwrote. And so I had to cut it back, and I actually cut it down to 60-something thousand words, and then I built it back up to 86,000 words. So this was quite a process, 
Um, fair is 105,000 words, and then mark is 94, but the normal is 80 to 120. Um, young adults are shorter, 60 to 80,000 words. Middle school, 20 to 60,000 words. Children's fiction, 10 to 12,000. And of course, there's exceptions. If you guys read Harry Potter, that middle book is massive. Yes. 257,000 words, and we all read all of it. Sometimes, <laughs> three times, right? Yes. And then, The Old Man in the Sea. I went to um, Florida, and I got to go to Ernest Hemingway's house, and I, I bought that book. Very good book, very short, and, and it was very successful. So there are exceptions to the rules. Um, novellas are very popular nowadays. People who have series, a lot of times they'll do spin-offs and novellas. I'm actually gonna do that one with this book. And so novellas are 20 to 40,000 40, words. Um, no, novelettes are 10 to 20,000 words, and then short stories are usually 10,000 words or under. Okay, protagonist. Protagonist is your main character. That's where the protagonist is. Um, then you have your antagonist, who's your villain. They oppose the main character. You have your secondary uh, characters, which include supportive and minor. Your supportive are essential to the plot. So she, Eve, in my first book, has a brother, and he's a, he is a supportive um, character. He's essential. But in my third book, there's... Um, a slave encampment that they find, and so the guards are just uh, minor characters. They're, they're there just to be part of the world building, but they're not essential to the plot. Okay, flat, static characters are uncomplicated. They do not transform. They only have one or two traits. They're predictable, and they're irritating. <laughs> if your character you can't be all good or all bad. Nobody's all good or all bad. We all have flaws. We all contradict ourselves sometimes. A real character will surprise you. They, they're, they're round and they're dynamic. So real people do unpredictable things. Real people will contradict themselves. Um, real people have flaws and struggles, but also qualities and victories. Dynamic characters remind us of ourselves. Um, they are imperfect, flat characters are irritating, and they're either all bad or good. So I'm going to read from one of my books, and I've never read from one of my books in front of people before, so this is going to be fun. I'm going to, so Bear, this is called the Enoma series. Enoma means name in Greek, and Bear is, I'll give you a little backstory. Um, his mom was hooked on drugs, he pretty much raised himself. He's a fighter in this new dystopian kind of world. He's a circuit fighter. He's half Caddo Indian, so I had to do a lot of research about Caddo Indian. I got a stack of books. Um, you won't be able to tell, though, because I didn't give you a download of information. It's just part of who he is. So I'm going to start, and just, I'm going to show you how he's not a flat character. I'm going to show you how he surprises his best friend. She's sick, Zach, Bear said. I know I've got to get her to eat before we go, Zach said. He was feeling ashamed at the state of his sister. He saw her through Bear's eyes and knew what he was thinking. She was too thin and too tired to go to the grief gathering. So the grief gathering was like a funeral. Are you determined to go with us, Bear asked Ruth, keeping his eyes fixed on her. Yes, she answered. Bear walked over to Ruth and gently took her wrist between his thumb and his first two fingers. His calloused hand enveloped Ruth's hand. Her heart rate is very slow, he said, drawing his hand away lightly. Bear said nothing more for a moment and finally spoke as if he made a decision. You will go, but you will need to eat and drink something on the way. Once you are done, you must lie down, so bring a pillow and a blanket. You are likely to get cold. I will stay in the back of the truck with the casket to make sure nothing happens. He turned to Zach, handing him the keys from his pocket. You will drive my truck. But no one drives your truck. Zach said, stunned. Today is different. So there is a dynamic, there is a dynamic character. He surprised his best friend. This man would never let anybody drive his car, but he saw this woman sick and he changed to help her. Probably because she reminded him of his mom. He probably grew up taking care of his mom. 
So that is a dynamic character that it will surprise you. Okay, point of view. So books can be written in first point of view, where um, the protagonist uses the word I and me. So the narrator is actually in the protagonist and saying I and me. Um, second person, fiction normally does not write in second uh, person, you, we. Um, nonfiction, you can do that. A lot of my nonfiction is from second person. Um, third person is what I write in. Third person limited, I don't know why anybody would do that, but third person limited, you write in third person from one character's point of view. So uh, you just say he, she, but you stick with that one person. Um, I do third person omniscient, and that is where I can go um, from Eve's point of view, and I can see what she's feeling, but then in another scene, I can go through Bear's, in another scene, I can go through someone else's. This is a series, and so I have an overarching story arc, a real big one, and so I, not everybody has all the pieces to the puzzle, so I need to use different characters so I can bring different pieces of the puzzle um, into the book, into the story. Okay, so you guys know who this is, right? It's, uh, Agent Smith from Matrix. You know how he could just hop into anybody's body at will? You can't do that with fiction writing. If you start a scene in one person's, uh, and you're narrating between, in one person's point of view, you cannot jump to another character at will and tell, tell me how they're feeling. Or you can't give me internal, internal dialogue from that person. Once you start a scene, you are stuck in that person's body. And you can show me what other characters feel and think by what, not what they think, but what they feel by how they react. If they're angry, you can show me through their actions or um, by what they say. But you can't just, it's called mind hopping when you jump into another person's mind. And a lot of new writers do that. But just remember, if you start a scene in one character's point of view, stick with that um, one character. Okay, all stories are made up of three things. Narration, narration tells, it connects the reader to the story. Exposition shows, it's the world building, where they're at, how the government is, all that. And then dialogue says, that's you can have internal dialogue or you can have um, um, just regular dialogue. Internal dialogue you wanna put in parentheses, regular dialogue you wanna put in quotes. So I'm gonna read just real quick from Mark, which is the third book of my series, page 250. Oh, this is a really good one. It's about Bear too. I'm gonna try not to cry. Um, he, because his mother was so abusive, well, she was, a, she was neglectful. Um, so when he grew up, he started abusing women. And so this is him learning how to forgive himself. And so you're gonna see all three narration, exposition, and dialogue. Bear needed to run. He wanted to watch the world around him turn quickly across his view. As he ran, he brought up the face of every woman he could remember from his past. When he saw each face, he said two simple words, forgive me. Each time a new face appeared, he said the statement again, forgive me. When he got to the river, he took a right and began to run alongside of it. The chant of the current repeated with him, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. His footsteps became lighter. The sun's rays streamed in through the trees, lighting his path of freedom. Finally, the image of Ruth's face appeared. This is his wife. And he slowed to a stop. The face of an innocent girl with the strength of a thousand women. He tried, oh, start crying. <laughs> He tried to say, forgive me, but she wouldn't take it. She simply said back, forgive him. And so, um, sorry for my cheeriness. I haven't read it in a while, so it's like, ooh. Okay, so when it said Bear needed to run, he wanted to watch the world around him turn quickly across his view. That's narration. That is the narrator kind of leading you in the story, telling you what's going on. Now, exposition would be, um, his footsteps became lighter. The sun's rays streamed through the trees, lighting the, his path of freedom. So that you get that image of the sun, you get the image of the river. That's exposition. That's where you're showing me where he's at. And then this one has internal dialogue, the forgiven part. So that would be dialogue. 
So that's a section that has all three, you want all three in your book, the narration, the exposition, and then the dialogue. Okay, so your story arc has, you remember you start with your purpose, that's the internal, you set your goal, that's the external, and then you have your rising action. And I use the carrots because you know the, um, the saying, you, you dangle the carrot in front of you, it's always out of reach. And that's what you want to do in your books. So you entice the reader to turn the page by keeping the goal always at a distance, just out of reach. Try to dangle a carrot at the end of each chapter. I said that. And so, um, so some stories have multiple plots in their story arc. So that's, you want to keep that tension. Like the book, if a, a bigger story arc would be then something happened and I couldn't write it and it was delayed. And, and then I got in a car accident and I, and I broke my, my hand and it was still delayed. And then that would be, you know, keeping the carrot where you, you delay, you delay it. And then finally, when you finally get it and after you've gone this far, the uh, goal is so much sweeter because it took much longer to reach it and it took more obstacles to get there. So if you can dangle that carrot and just keep it out of reach, out of reach, and then we finally get it, it's just so sweet. Like when Frodo finally put that ring inside, inside Mount Doom, it was like, oh yes, it was awesome. Okay. Okay, inciting this incident. You see that right here, inciting incident? That's kind of the thing that throws the character into um, to the, the story. So this, I have a, um, um, Albert Morales, he's from Corpus Christi. Me and my husband met him when we were in Gardendale a long time ago. He's actually a comic strip, art, comic strip artist. He's written, he's done fantastic for Spider-Man, Wolverine, New Avengers. His bio was so long I couldn't fit it. But this, he drew this. This is my character Florna for my new young adult um, fiction novel that's coming out. Uh, it's already done, I'm just getting him to draw it. And so, isn't she pretty? <laughs> I'm just so excited. And so the inciting incident in this book is that her best friend gets taken. So that, that's what kind of throws you in the story. A lot of fantasy fiction does um, orphan, Batman, Spider-Man, Superman, Harry Potter, Tarzan, all these are orphans. And I thought, you know, I'm gonna do something different. She's gonna have a great family, uh, not a perfect family, but she's gonna have a good family, and so she loses her best friend. And so that's the inciting incident that gets you thrown into the story. Okay, so anybody know Rudy? The story of Rudy, this young boy wanted to play for Notre Dame, um, but he was too broke, not smart enough, and he was not big enough really to do it. It was kind of impossible, but he had that call inside of him to do it. We got to meet him, that's him. See how little he is? He's, he's, still, he's not a big guy to play college football, but he had that calling in him, and his obstacle from here to over here had obstacles, dyslexia, too broke, he didn't even live in that city, he was homeless, he, um, he there's so many things he had to overcome just to achieve that goal. And the coolest part, the best ending of a book, the best ending, is where this person has a call and it's impossible for them to achieve. And so when he gets over here and he's, he's finally on the team, but he, he, he's not big enough to play so nobody believes him. And so the best endings is when at the end they still can't achieve it and someone else has to help them. And so the stands were saying, Rudy, Rudy, and the coach, I mean, and the players, and they finally let Rudy go on the, out on the field. He sacks the quarterback and the commentator says his name. And it was so sweet because he went after a dream that was impossible. There was no way he should have been on that team. And I think people recognize that. And at the end, they helped him. So I'm gonna skip all that. Okay, so here's this meme. You always see it. It's Gandalf. Instead of walking the ring to Mount Doom, why not use the giant eagles you know and fly? Frodo, that is a much better idea. I'm glad that you thought of that. But, he got his ring, and up right here, and he put in Mount Doom. Do you have a story? Because you have no obstacles. You have no tension. You don't have a story. The obstacles are part of the story. You need those obstacles. You need those atten the, that tension because the character arc will never happen. 
person will not change unless they have obstacles. So you need those obstacles. Okay, so here's me seven days after I had my third baby. So I had this, this desire to lose weight and be fit. And so I, I did a goal, a bodybuilding competition. There were obstacles in the way. And on the bottom, I wrote a book about it. That's the character arc. So the, the story arc is me accomplishing that goal. The character arc is what happened to me, how I transformed. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And then here, <laughs> I wanted to fight in an MMA cage fight. And so I trained there. I achieved my goal and I won by technical knockout in one minute and nine seconds. Mm -hmm. My husband reminded me. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's the story arc. You have that internal purpose. You make that external goal. There's obstacles, there were a lot of obstacles. There was a woman 40 pounds heavier than me. She was my obstacle and she gave me chest contusions. And then this book, I wrote about it. That's what, that's how I transformed. That's my character transformation that happened in that book. Here, my identical twin sister almost died 14 years ago in a car accident. Um, among all the stuff that happened to her body, her nose started twisting and she was unable to breathe. And I wanted to help her. How am I going to help her? She, she had a surgery. It didn't fix it. And I thought, what can I do? What can I do? I can write. And so I wrote a reality TV show called Botched. And we were on the reality TV show just a little while ago. And her nose was fixed by Dr. Nassif, the best uh, nose surgeon in the world. And so that was the goal. It got completed. This book is a story arc. You have, I mean, the character arc. You have the story arc. Her nose was broken, and then it was fixed. And you have the character arc, how we transform during that process, during those obstacles. So you see, in the beginning, I showed you the flowers. These are real, and then I showed you the art. But um, art is a representation of real life. So when I tell you what makes a good story, it's the same thing that can be applied to your life. And then, Okay, why do you go to a gym? Why do you go to a gym? Okay, you don't. But why do people go to a gym? They go to a gym to put tension on their muscles. Your muscles will not grow unless you tear the muscle fibers. You are purposely putting tension on your body to grow. And so you set your, I'll just talk to you guys. And so in your life, the goals you set, you don't have to be a writer, but you'll have this calling in your life sometimes. And you'll feel like you need to do something. And sometimes the goal is you know, not too big. You want to find a dress for a certain thing. You go to the store, you try to one, you find one, and you, and you got your goal. You know, it was a sweet, little sweet victory, but sometimes you want to get a college degree. You have this purpose to get a college degree. And to get in your diploma, is way over here. And what's in between your purpose of getting a college degree and getting that diploma? What's in the between? Obstacles. Lots of tests. I know my sister Shay is going to school and I keep telling her, don't give up. Homework, quizzes, books you have to read, professors you have to deal with. There's <laughs> obstacles in between. I just talked about you, you didn't hear me. Okay. <laughs> she complains to me about writing 300 words. I'm like, really? I published about a million. But okay. Um, so in between your goal, your purpose of getting a college degree, there's obstacles. That is part of life. You, you Just by living, you have meaning and value. You have that purpose. You set those goals. There's going to be obstacles and tension along the way. But if you say, you know what, I don't want to get my college degree. Is all the tension and obstacles in your life going to go away? No, you're going to be broke. That's an obstacle. Not all, not everybody who has a degree, doesn't have a degree, is not broke, but you know what I mean. You're going to have other obstacles that are leading away from your goal. Those are called counterfeit, that's called counterfeit tension, the negative tension. And that hurts you, it doesn't help you. And so, when you're here and you have an obstacle and there's tension, it's better just to go that way because life has tension, 
You're not going to get away from it. So might as well experience the good tension that's going to get you to your goal than the negative tension that's going to give you get you away from your goal. You want a healthy marriage? I've been married almost 20 years. You need to be a healthy, healthy person, you know? And sometimes that's hard, you know? And, and you have to go through all these obstacles, deal with past injuries, deal with um, family issues, and go to counseling and read books and work on yourself and be that healthy person so you can attract the healthy person. Or you can date losers and still experience tension and obstacles. Either way you go, you're going to experience obstacles and tension, but you want the positive tension, the tension worth reading, the tension that people want to read and learn from. That's what you want. And so you can go to a gym and put tension on your body, or you can go to the gym and flail around and, and, and use the machines incorrectly and injure yourself. You still have tension, but it's hurting you. It's not helping you. It's making you injured and not growing you. And so life has obstacles and there's tension, but you want to do the tension that gets you to your goal. That might be it. I'm sorry if I ran along. Okay, here's my books. Um, Eva, uh, a Noma series starts with Eva Awakening, the first book I've ever written. Um, I have two fitness books. And when I went to Texas A&M Corpus Christi, I didn't know whether I wanted to be a writer, a major in writing, or kinesiology. And finally, I did write uh, English. I'm sorry, English or kinesiology. And my guidance counselor, when I was a junior in college, said you needed to declare a major. And I said, okay, English. But 20 years later, I got to write two uh, fitness books, so it kind of came full, full circle, circle for me. Fallen God into the Cage, about cage fighting. This one's about doing bodybuilding, um, the reality TV show. Our Six is Seven, I wrote in 10 days. I really feel like God gave me that in 10 days. And Pastor Bill Cornelius um, Church of Church Unlimited did a forward for that one. And then um, Slay the Day, it's a one-year devotional that took me five years to write. <laughs> and it literally did, it took me five years to write it. And then these are meditation books, and then this is the book that goes to um, African missions. So that's it. Thank you so much, Dr. Harley.